Why haven't we got a drink? Ebba's won't let us have a drink and he's provided us tiny little egg cups. Thimble. What is your problem? At least they're not wine glasses. What have you got for us? Well, I wanted to talk about a very special moment that I shared with Kush and Slater not long ago. Oh, lovely. Announcement. <laughs> <laughs> When's it due? <laughs> and I thought it was only appropriate to have a taste of that very moment. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh, oh, I see what's happening. Oysters and yeah. yeah, aphrodisiac. So as you know, the three of us went on a food team safari a couple of weeks ago to uh, Croatia as part of Vlogfest. And I thought we'd bring you back a taste of one of our most special moments there. Cheers. Cheers. Picture yourself. Oh, that is delicious. Sat below a beautiful blue sky and sat above beautiful blue water. Better that way round than the other. <laughs> In Maliston, and we had oysters, and I think it was said at the time by Slater that this was his Rick Stein moment. You know those moments when you're kind of just growing up and being inspired by chefs who love seafood and travel, <coughs> and the three of us were sat at an oyster farm pulling up oysters, which were completely unique to us, and enjoying them the way they liked them in Maliston. They look unlike any oysters I've ever seen but before. You, you serve them on the lid rather than... Yeah. yeah, so that's one thing that we learnt straight away. They serve them on the lid there because they're so fresh, straight out of the water. They don't bother putting it in the cup or in the, uh, you know, the curved side of the shell with all the juice. They say, no, just taste the oyster on its own. You don't need more salt. Don't need more salt water. So it's kind of getting rid of that brine. And Mali Ston was kind of half estuary water, so fresh water coming down from the mountains and half of the sea water, which was very salty. We went for a swim. So you, you didn't even have to tread water, you just bob about, it's so oh, salty, yeah. amazing. Yeah. We bobbed most more than most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining as we eat these, there's going to be some wonderful drone footage over the top of it, because it was drone-tastic, that trip. We can definitely give you a, a little taster of the area we're in, not with a drone that day, because this particular place, Tom had already crashed the drone. Yeah. This, was, <laughs> this was day two. So this is close to Dubrovnik, is it? Yeah, just north of. Okay. And obviously it's later, has had a fair few oysters in his time, as have Kush and I, but none of us had had them prepared this like this on the flat shell, and none of us had seen them grown the way they do. Cheers. 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 Mm, wonderful. I have to say, these aren't the same oysters from Ston. Well, they're fresh, though. Well, they are I very like fresh. Those. They're from Bethel Green Fish, but I was thinking, pack a few in a suitcase, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> That's how I brought the beer back, and he let me down on the uh, oyster front. Yeah, so okay. These are really cold, but as we plucked them out of the, the water, we literally ate them within minutes of coming out of the water, and therefore they were water temperature, which was kind of lovely yeah. and warm. Yeah. And, and, and it, that brings a, a whole different dimension to it. That, uh, to be honest, what I think one of my favourite memories that I've had of us travelling was in... Thor. Richmond with Thor. Oh yeah, in, what a man. in the, in the what US, a man. where we went to an oyster farm there, and we were yeah, what shin deep in the sea, whilst they collected the oysters, brought them back, and we were eating them with some white wine. It was yeah, yeah, yeah off the so bay where uh, apparently Pocahontas and John Smith mm. met or encountered Chesapeake Bay. Whoa. Excellent memory. You retain so much stuff. Why can't you cook? <laughs> <laughs> wine on that trip was a good choice. We also had posh ship which is a very local wine, so what made... What's the name? Poship. Oh, oh right, Poship. It, um, I think there's a missing bit at the beginning. I think it's... Ah. Poship. <laughs> Poship real good. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> no, so Poship was a lovely grape variety that we... Um, wine variety we had while we were out there. We drank a lot, of. a lot of that when it's ice cold in the sun with, with simple, simple seafood. But the moment I thought was interesting was understanding how they farm these because they are so labour intensive. They wait till they're a half decent size and they literally take them out and cement them to ropes in pairs and then they get dropped back into the water. And the process goes on and on and on. It's three to five years before these are that. finally... It looks a bit like a Brussels sprout. Yeah. For every oyster that they harvest, they have to touch that oyster six times. Hyper labour intensive really, you know, artisan, you could say hand-grown, hand-harvested, but really is, it's not mass-produced, it's not farmed, it's not dredged, and you can really tell the difference. Wow. That's mm -hmm. why oysters are sometimes expensive, mm -hmm. because of the process they go to when they are cared for and respected. And it was that moment when we realised how lucky we were to be there and to be eating that food 
and it was something we wanted to bring back. Oh, and you're drinking Croatian beer. There's lots of lovely uh, lagers, craft beers as well. We tried lots of Dalmatian wine, um, particularly from sort of the, the south end of... Um, How many of them were there? Oh. <laughs> to try. Like so. the Dalmatian ham. Right. It's also very tasty. <laughs> the, the, the Dalmatian coast. Yeah, yeah. Great, well while you're topping up, I would like to talk about a really cool Instagram profile and foodie newsletter that I follow. So this is Beth O'Brien, she's 26 years old and she's a trained uh, pastry chef. She trained at the Bally Malo Cookery School. And what I love, this is right up my street, is that she does what she calls the three by three comparison tests. She will take nine recipes for one thing, test them, make them, and then compare them and write notes on which, where the differences lie and what she liked about e each of them. And then she takes what she's learned, makes her own version, and then publishes it on her newsletter, which is called Taste Buds. And this is my kind of food analysis. Yeah. I love it. Geeky deep I, dive. I don't have the ability or the time to do it myself. And it's just brilliant. And she's done loads of stuff. So she's done sort of Portuguese custard tarts. Wow. She's done bagels. She's done Victoria sponges. She's done all those, all those things. I know we spoke about the baking last, uh, last one of these, but she's done all the things that you'd love to bake or cook. But as a trained chef, it's an approach, not nearly as analytical and nine and to that degree. It's the approach that we've been developing recipes for years, which is if you don't know, you look at a bunch of recipes, six, eight, ten recipes that are published in different places, and we don't necessarily cook them all, but you try and eke from them some learning, some best bits, and then you kind of take your own kind of chefy instincts and, and take little bits and pieces that are inspired from here, there, and, and put your own version out there. The fact that she's gone to the nth degree of actually testing verbatim those nine and then picking the best bits and creating her own is just a step further. I keep going back to it, but the dough course that we did, I still, I, I searched for a cinnamon bun recipe for about a year, year and a half, and I tried so many multiple sources and never quite found one that worked. Whether or not I was executing it correctly is up for debate. Mm -hmm. But same with the pizza dough. Like there were so many times where I wanted to do like a good pizza party with friends round, but I was experimenting with a brand new dough because I didn't have time to do it. And this kind of approach is just, I just find it really cool, really fascinating. And I love deep diving into the small subtleties and the differences between each recipe and then picking accordingly. And what's really cool is that Beth also released a calendar um, where each month you'd have the image of, of the, the three by three um, and then her recipe published um, each month. And uh, she raised some money for uh, the Ukraine as well by, by selling it. Um, nice. And it looks really cool. So I bought one of those. Um, yeah, I think she's great. Uh, when are we getting her in for a burger battle? Uh, good. Hopefully if she sees this. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, I love the fact that Beth's kind of forged out what that's what she does on Instagram because somebody that well, we've followed for years is Felicity Cloak and she does exactly the same thing for oh. The Guardian. And I, I don't know what frequency, but it's weekly, monthly, but basically she'll go fish pie is the theme and she'll cook a fish pie recipe from six or seven different chefs and she'll tell you what's good and bad about each and then publish her did they, perfect Did recipe. she ask you for your tips? No, no, no I stole yeah, all of her. Yeah. I do have one problem with Beth, <laughs> is that she's never ever picked a sorted food one to test. <laughs> she's had Ravni, she's had Claire Saffitz, she's had Ed Kimber, never assorted. So, I mean, what does that say? Maybe sorted recipes don't need, com there is no comparison. She, she wants, that's true actually, she doesn't want to blow the competition yeah, out of the water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, like it. What, uh, that's who I'd like to uh, shine a light on today. Worth a follow. Yeah, worth a taste. <laughs> Gosh, I don't think there's any cookies. I'm not baking cookies, I made cinnamon rolls last time. It's someone else who's there to talk about something. Oh, I've been down a very deep and dark. Are you on TikTok oh, again? No. We, need to, we need to stop this. Get off your thumb, you're gonna have RSI in your thumb. Yeah, I wanna to talk to you about candy chamois pickles. It's something that uh, has been a bit of a trend over the last few months uh, in Mexico and in Hispanic communities across the US. It came over to the UK, really difficult to get hold of. So they started selling kits to make your own chamois pickles. Like Do you want to have a look at the video that I first saw that sparked my interest? 
I came to this market just to get this pickle. It's a candy chamoy pickle. Not only is the sauce homemade. He grows his own pickles. He grows his own pickles? Check it out. Oh, okay. So we marinate them for a week. We grind them for about a month. A week? There's no vinegar and low sodium. I've actually never seen someone love their pickles so much. To the point where you can order this on delivery. He says, Oh, oh stop. stop. Oh. Stop rolling stuff in fruit roller. So, sorry, after the conversation in the last video. Yeah. It's, do you know why? It's because you watched the video, now it's fed you this. Yeah. Snack is yours. <laughs> Inspired by his wife's Salvadorian dessert. I'm drooling really eating it. Are you sorry? <laughs> I thought I would just like eat one bite. But it's just one of those flavors that you want to keep eating. It's like kimchi. It's like kimchi. <laughs> This is something that was recommended to us by somebody in the community. They said that we have to try it. After, only yeah. after you were doing root follow up last time. <laughs> this, is based, this is based off a Salvadorian dessert. I'm sorry okay. that the four of you can't open your minds to something no, 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 that no, no, hits no. every single element of your taste buds. It's sweet, sour, yeah. savoury, spicy. It's got everything going on. It's less about the origins and the history. It's more about you and fruit roll-ups for me. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's how and where you find them. I'm nervous. Here we go, boys. At least we're using up the rest of the roll-ups. No, so you don't use fruit roll-ups. Oh. <sighs> you need something a bit different. Fruit by the foot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all about balance, isn't it? Because we've got kosher, sour, dill, hot. hot. Spicy. hot. And then what we've got is um, tajin. Oh. Uh, tajin seasoning. This is classic Mexican seasoning. And then we have shamoy. the chamoy sauce. So the chamoy sauce um, is a condiment mostly found in Mexico made from apricot or plum or mango with chilies, salt and lime juice. This is the hot pickle, this one. Ooh. Oh my goodness. The Jamie's Eyes pickle. Cheers. Wrap it around my pickle, oh. Ibbers. You'd be terrible as a mummy, wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> so, could I have some hot sauce, please, bro? Lovely, thank you. Perfect. I'll do some tajin. You bought yeah. this for the table. You, did, did, you yeah. did this yourself? <laughs> Who would like to see a Lady in the Tramp moment? Between Baz no, and no, 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 no. Barry and Jamie? Comment below. No, 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 no. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. It is just everything to excess that I don't understand. He's trying so hard to be open-minded. Mm -hmm. It's not a poker face, Jay. <laughs> that goes in waves. Because on the outside you're getting the spice. And then you move down, you get another the sweet. layer of spice. <laughs> no, you get the sweet from the. You are close, you're so close minded. <laughs> all of you. Come down, you get the sweetness, and then you get the sourness of the pickle right, underneath. Fine then. Yeah. It's a good mixture. Come, we will have to do it now. Knock me on. off a bit. So I'd st I go back to the original question. Authentically, where do they these begin? Yeah, but they don't use fruit by the foot. <laughs> Is this Salvador? <laughs> this is Jamie's version of sushi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll have another bit. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Because you've got the novelty out. Cheers. <laughs> I think it's spicy. It's not for me. It tastes like a trash can. Yeah, it feels like a mistake. And it's stays in your teeth. And yet, I think that sauce is absolutely delicious. I always already use the Tajin seasoning at home and I love it on eggs. That is superb. On roast potatoes, yeah, I imagine yeah. there's yeah. so many places where those individual components can, maybe not those, individual components can work, but I, yeah, I'm not sure about the combination. It's it's a, maybe it's a me thing. I think sliced up pickles dressed with the sauce and, and that, that great. on top of something. Maybe we used the wrong colour. Like we can try a different colour if you want. <laughs> Would it have gone as viral on TikTok if it didn't have the extreme version of something sweet on no. it? No. And, and, and I think that might be the problem. I feel like we've got to a place in the inter interwebs where you need to drive extreme to get any traction, yeah. and extreme isn't necessarily good. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I tried I'm it. Not, I no, I think it was terrible. Was awful. I like <laughs> trying new things. But, but, but hey. Exactly. I think the minute that you stop experimenting is the minute that you might as well roll over and die. I'm going to hold you to that later. Fine. I think what's nice is the juxtaposition between <laughs> things like this that are brought to the table by normals 
And oh, no, don't make it about chefs and normals. No, oh, no. And no. we brought to you the no. simplest oyster that needed nothing doing right, to okay, it. Done okay, well. you wait 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 we'll come back to this, this thought. I can't wait for next month already. Right, so, <laughs> to get over that, can we talk about Gustavo? So, this guy has been storming YouTube all over the place. You'll probably know him as Guga Foods. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, of course. I think we've all looked at his videos for inspiration for our own show when it comes to steak. He's the king of sous vide reverse searing, and dry aging. He's done everything, so we don't have to. No, I'm really sorry, but I haven't been like taking tips from Guga. I've not dry aged anything, but I thought we'd look at some videos instead. You and you need to pick up your game. Okay. <laughs> Find something, bring it to the table. But I made a load of cinnamon rolls. Last stuff. month! Yeah, that you, was a month ago. You Stop wrapped, talking about it. We bought ice cream. In you sent Kush a shopping rolls. list. Yeah. <laughs> Twice now. Yeah. His dry age videos are awesome. Yeah. Again, like another person who goes through the full process, films absolutely everything, loads of time consuming stuff for the viewer's benefit. I love that kind of thing. Yeah, the, the, the two things that catch my attention from him are the dry aging, where he's dry aged in like the hottest spices around. Um, that was an, oh, baking soda. Like dry aging it in baking soda, salt, even like there's dry aging a one pound steak, improve it as what? well. Um, what's the science behind dry aging in baking soda? What, what would that offer? Well, baking soda uh, from uh, Chinese cookery, you put it into pounded meat products to break down the proteins and give that bounce and texture. So it'd be breaking down the proteins and s speeding up the dry aging process, which is a denaturation of the protein strands to make more tender products. So. And the element of osmosis, so it will draw around some of that yeah. moisture as well. His approach to steak is how I think uh, all the things that normal wants to know, but also so does the chef, but neither would ever do. <laughs> like, because they're all time consuming, they're all ridiculous challenges. And expensive. Yeah, yeah, really expensive. Unless in some occasions he does things where he takes the cheapest cut of meat and tries to bring it to life. We did it through tenderizing, um, but he's been injecting Wagyu tallow into steak into to see the cheapest if he can cuts. bring it back as well. Every one of his videos pretty much ends in the same way, him eating steak. Uh, so the man is like, well versed in steak now. He knows a good steak from a bad steak. And if you watch stuff his videos, he does still break down how to make a great steak every single time and then go a thousand miles beyond that as well. I'm looking at you as the person I think this appeals to the most. Yeah, I really, I really like his videos from a... Because also, a lot of the time, it's not complicated stuff that he's doing. He's putting a steak in mayonnaise and leaving it there for days How at a time. How did that one turn out? Really, really good. Like, it, was deli uh, it looked great steak. Um, and apparently it tasted like great steak. It had more of a, it caramelised more on the outside. Uh, it was more tender in the middle, I think. They're, they're, um, not, they're not things yeah. you're ever going to do at home, but it kind of teaches you the science behind what they all do. So you can kind of take a little bit of it and apply it at home. <laughs> also, I, want, I wanted to talk about him here because I would love to get him on the channel at some point. I think what he's doing is fascinating. Oh, so you're literally calling him out for a Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> in a video. He's collabing with everybody and I want to get involved. I think he's, he's not in East London. Maybe that's the problem. We'll get him over it or we'll go to him. Where does he live? I don't know. He doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> he could be in East London. He could be in East London. Yeah, but what if he's in West London? That's no. miles away. I know, it takes yeah, ages to get across town. It's time to whap your flip-flops out because this summer, Sorted Live brings you The Wild Weekender, a festival-style weekend of live stream Sorted Mayhem. Tickets available now. See the link below for all the information. A bucket of beer. What's he doing? I imagine this is how he hosts all his parties at home. So. <sighs> oh, no. Oh, no, no, he sorry. loves the control. I thought we'd go for a cocktail to finish the day. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah so I've given us all a glass of choice. I think you'd like that one. Uh, Love Defo. <laughs> uh, Jay. Ooh. Uh, and I'm going for a uh, specially branded pass it on pint glass. Oh, nice. That's the spill. Yeah. yeah. 
Also, is that I love Guinness and uh, Michael Huddlestone. Yeah. One thing Michael Huddlestone likes. I loves, love both of those things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing Mike really likes is uh, Monster energy drinks. Yeah. Don't deny it. I've been on Instagram doing a bit of doom scrolling myself and something popped up, um, did a bit of research and it's based on something from the 18th century in the UK called a black and tan. Actual monster. Oh my goodness, actual, oh. <laughs> Emma is fuming. Black yeah. being a stout or a porter and the tan being an amber ale. Quite a popular drink in the past where you'd get half a pint of an amber ale and pour the black over the top and it would float. And when you drink it, you get a bit of both. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's now migrated into what can you float Guinness on top of? What even is this flavour? Uh, it said punch energy. <laughs> this is pipeline punch pipeline flavour. Punch. But essentially, the drink's this. Oh, it's, wow, it's a good colour. It's a good, good colour. So this should work by the fact that Guinness has a lower sick density than Amber ale or so you're trying monster. to get on side by using sides. Okay, be before you do this, remember you, you've got a relatively decent reputation. You worked at a two Michelin star restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, but you should have seen some of the things they ate and drank after work. Yeah. Yeah. So this this will uh, wake you up and calm you down. <laughs> Science. So you want to float it on top. That is really that cool. Is I like it. I mean, it's I applaud you, Kush, fun. for making science cool. Didn't we used to do this when we were 18? Like, baby yeah, Guinness, baby to, to Maria. Yeah. I'm gonna try some floating Croatian lager. Ooh. So what have you got for others? Might spoil a good ale. Ooh. Well, this is the classic. <laughs> so you've got the black and the tan. Oh, 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 Barry! Barry Taylor. Science. Barry got bored. Barry got bored. So when Slater was on here last, he did a espresso martini topped with Parmesan. Yeah, it was terrible. It was terrible. So let's see, this is in honor of him. Is it a cocktail? I Doesn't a cocktail have to have three or more ingredients in it? I think a co uh, Oxford Advice. Dictionary says a cocktail has to have a spirit in it. Mm. Mm. But a prawn cocktail doesn't. Mary Rose sauce has brandy in it. Yes, Chef. Oh! Sorry, oh. Chef. Oh. Chef school. Oh. Right. right. Cheers. 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 It's been a good week. To the experimental table. Yeah. Cool. It's not terrible, it's just, it's just sweet. It's like a, it's a Guinness shandy. Yes. It's oh, a sweet Guinness it shandy, that's exactly what it is. You lose all of the Guinness. On the nose, you get all of the hoppy IPA, which is a grapefruit IPA as well, so you get that citrus note, and then you just have a slightly more viscous mouthfeel from Guinness. I think the fruitiness works, but it's just so hyper sweet that it actually ruins it at the end but you get the bitter smoothness of the Guinness and then a little bit of a fruity, like if you had like a fruit juice or, or a, more of a tropical punch, I think that could work, but it's so insanely sweet that once you've drunk it, you're like, oh. I've just oh. never wanted to put Guinness with anything. I, right. Guinness is, is, is perfect by itself. Beef, oysters <laughs> and pastry. Oh, yeah. uh, okay, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so what, oysters, beef, Guinness? Yeah. <laughs> Well, again, I'm glad I tried it. Yeah. I won't try it again. I think what this has actually just become is the guinea pig table to do things around this table that these guys don't ever have to do. Yeah, that's it. We are the crash... I wouldn't repeat <laughs> much of what we did today. We're the crash test dummies of the internet. <laughs> Amazing. Well, cheers, boys. Cheers to another cheers. month. I can't wait to see what we bring next month. <laughs> you are off TikTok.